Hello everyone, welcome to our uh, ML Gdańsk online meetup. Our guest today is Professor Luther Krieger from Wrocław uh, and from Mokos Group. And he will tell us something about predicting COVID pandemic. Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the invitation. And um, I'm happy to uh, present some work of our group here. I know that some time ago, Martin Bordig already gave a talk about um, the MOCOS model, some algorithmic aspects. So I will um, have a little bit different topics here um, to avoid repetition. Let me put it that way. OK, I just go now to the screen sharing and I switch off my camera. Um, and I hope in a second. So, can you see my screen? Yes, it's visible. All right. So, the title of my talk is Predicting the Unpredictable. It's a little bit provocative title, of course, but um, I will mainly speak, give a little bit an overview about mathematical models and the focus will be uh, of course on agent-based models but i will mention also a few other ones and um, what kind of insights you actually could gain from those models and i will speak about something which is not so frequently presented in well talks about covid predictions um, I will speak about structural insights you can gain from mathematical models. And um, uh, yeah, so as is nice um, saying by Niels Bohr, it's hard to predict, especially the future. And um, uh, what you see here on the right side is a kind of unusual prediction, actually. I will later on say a few words on that. Um, so most people associate with predictions more or less to tell how these figures which you see here, which are a snapshot over the first year actually um, of epidemics in different countries, how those pictures continue to the right side, right? And you see that um, uh, the figures, these are the cases, the daily cases here, are quite heterogeneous, right? So very different patterns you can see here. And uh, most people think that is the main focus of predictions. And I would like to make a point here that's actually only part of the um, of what you would associate with predictions. And um, specifically, these are forecasts, right? But already the first model, the first mathematical model for infectious diseases, which was at the beginning of the last century done, I mean, um, independently by Ross and Lotka, was about malaria. And the aim of those models, um, and malaria is a relatively complex um, disease, at least in terms of um, spreading, because you involve not just humans, you involve mosquitoes and the parasite, and you, know, you see all the biological um, stuff. The main focus, um, what they wanted to do with the model, to predict um, what is the most effective way to control and to fight malaria not to predict the number of cases or the number of deaths or the number of people in the hospital. And um, so I would roughly group the different prediction categories of um, epidemic mathematical models, right? We speak here about epidemic models, into um, four groups. Um, the first one is that what we associate traditionally with uh, predictions, this is forecast, like the weather forecast, right? And I will um, show you that this is actually relatively difficult, especially when the dynamic, at turning points of the dynamics, right? So um, that means when a wave goes off and when it stops and turns down. Mm -hmm. And this is the things, the 
people are mostly interested in, of course, especially if you speak with policymakers, right, in health policy. The second group is to, um, of predictions is to analyze and actually predict the effect of countermeasures, um, which would slow down the epidemics, right? This um, hardly will be so detailed that you can somehow say, well, if I do this and this, then precisely this and this will happen. But you can certainly say something on um, how effective in a group of countermeasures the one is against another one. And we have um, all been aware of a lot of countermeasures where people try to slow down or actually stop an outbreak. Um, so this is contact reduction, which we all um, suffered for a long time um, during the epidemics. This has to do with testing levels and the speed of testing, but also with contact tracing. Right, so these are countermeasures, and you would like to use mathematical models to actually predict what would be the effect or the impact of the epidemics. And because you don't know when certain countermeasures will um, take into action by policymakers, it's actually very hard to say uh, to predict the future. Right. The second thing, the third thing, is understanding structural effects. And I will go a little bit in detail um, on the impact of um, households, which are a social structure, right? How many people in a given country live together? Um, we have households, single households, two-person households, and so on. There's, of course, also a structural factor related to mobility that depends how far your workplace is from the place you live. And um, a good part of mobility is actually uh, created by children because they have to go to school. Um, and it's also um, things like urbanization and, um, and density of populations which have an impact of the epidemic. These are structural um, effects or structural uh, features which you would like to understand how they really relate to the epidemics. And I think this is the point where mathematical theory is at its strongest. And a large group, um, this would be actually a perfect, is actually a perfect task for machine learning methods, is to predict the patient outcome once you are infected, conditioned on age, gender, maybe still some genetic predispositions or um, existing um, comorbidities, that means diseases which you have already. And uh, my colleague in Warsaw, um, Przemysław Biecek, is actually here on the forefront of doing this kind of patient outcome predictions with, well, a lot of tools of modern machine learning. I will not speak about that at all today, all right? It's a different mathematical models you need here. Um, there are still, and this I didn't put here because they don't exist yet for COVID, um, models which describe how the virus replicates in the organism, which have to take into account the immune system and a lot of um, molecular biological factors. And since they are poorly known, um, even after two years of epidemics, um, there is still um, almost complete lack on mathematical models which describe the in-host um, propagation, right? Certainly a very, very interesting task, but also for previous diseases, um, this is still, well, um, to have to, has to, to come, okay? Good, so um, predicting the timeline, so forecasting is notoriously difficult. And I show you here a snapshot from um, the German forecast hub um, in, um, there is actually a German, Polish, and, and now a European COVID-19 forecast hub. If you Google European um, forecast hub or German, Polish forecast hub, you will find um, a site with, um, where a lot of groups actually put their predictions on. And um, what you see here is um, uh, the black line um, or the, ground data, right? So this is the true evolution of the epidemics. And you see relatively nicely how far off the predictions, and this I think here are, well, three, four weeks predictions, um, with confidence bound. So this uh, 
vertical columns are the confidence bandwidth overlap here because I found many of the predictions in it. And you see where the problem, where the predictions are somehow diverse. Um, there's one group um, at the beginning. So precisely to tell when a wave goes up, and this was the autumn wave here in the first year of the epidemics, so the real first big outbreak we had because the first wave was relatively quickly stopped by imposing very strong countermeasures over all of Europe. Um, so that models had problems with that. And, and the same thing, they had problems in getting the turning point, so the, the maximum um, point correctly and um, extra predicting that now the numbers will go down. Of course, this is that the numbers went go down is not because the epidemic saturated here, which would be just a free evolution of an epidemics. And in Europe, we had very few examples of epidemics um, before the Omicron wave came uh, of epidemics, which somehow stopped because you, they reached a natural saturation point. Um, Poland's fourth wave in the last autumn and winter was one exception because there we more or less don't, did do anything. Um, but all our countries still tried um, with um, more or less stringent restrictions um, to stop the wave and were successful actually, right? So um, with very few exceptions in Europe, um, uh, um, the wave was always turned down because of countermeasures at a given point, time of point. And that time of point when it comes is of course difficult to predict. Good. Um, these are our own predictions here during the second and the third wave. Of course, we have also now predictions for the fourth wave and the Omicron wave, but I think um, I, I don't want to speak here how, how, uh, how the actually predictions are, but just to show you that um, we are pretty well performing in comparison to our groups. But um, again, we, we suffered similar problems, right? So we had an overprediction here on the right side, especially in the deaths uh, with Poland. And one else has to say that Poland, the prediction was actually pretty good if you take the excess death into account. And on the left side, you see um, two weeks ahead predictions. Um, and again, um, at the turning Point, it's very hard to get it right. We, we are more lucky in the third wave. So this was the, um, exactly a year ago um, to predict how things went. But there is always a little bit um, luck involved, right, to get it right. Um, interestingly, um, a very good prediction, relatively good predictions you obtain if you average over the outcomes of different models. And um, here I showed on the right side a list of models which do predictions for Poland. It's, um, well, it varies a little bit over time. I would say between 15 up to 20 groups predict uh, for Poland. Three of the groups directly sit in Poland. It's our, our group, um, um, Franciszek um, Rakowski in Warsaw from the ICM and um, in Gdansk, um, Professor Redlaski has also um, a prediction, not for deaths, but for cases. Actually, a pretty good one. And, um, uh, yeah, but what I have, what you see here, the green, um, the green columns or the green predictions, this is the average of all the predictions you have here. And this average predictions in, and this is cross whole Europe, right? Now this forecast hub, European forecast hub, give predictions for whole of Europe, actually is always among the top groups on prediction value. So ensembling or doing a mean of predictions seems to be a good way to avoid, I mean, yeah, too much um, going off or um, of, the, of, the, of the real numbers, how they involve. Um, this um, confidence bounds, which you, up, which you see here, are on the technical side, and that is true for all groups, whether you have um, an agent-based model or a differential equations model, usually obtained because you run either, usually with different parameters, because you are not sure about some of the parameters, individual trajectories. So you have, you see here some 
up-to-date predictions, which we right now did a few days ago for Saxony, um, what would be the impact of a Freedom Day um, in 1st of April when all the restrictions um, are put down, which is the plan in Germany at the moment. And um, this, um, the, the red line here is the median. And, um, but the median itself, and this is also what you see in the forecasts in this forecast tab, doesn't correspond really to a trajectory. Right, um, so the individual trajectories lie um, uh, either below, they're also a little bit different in shape. Um, and um, yeah, you, you do a lot of uh, different simulations, usually with different parameters, uh, has also some intrinsic stochastic stochasticity here. And then you get, um, and the parameters you estimate usually via, via a Bayesian Monte Carlo um, scheme. And um, you see on the left side, this is the fit here. This, they're all more or less the same trajectories. And then they scatter around depending on the different parameters, which you are not 100% sure about. Mostly in our model, this affects the level of the efficiency of um, testing and the efficiency of contact tracing. Our models have different parameters, which they vary. Good, so let me come um, from this uh, forecast uh, topic a little bit to a bird's view on the types of mathematical models which are on the market, um, I would say, just to give you a short overview. And um, for most infectious diseases, um, the majority of models are ordinary differential equations model or compartment models. There are stochastic variants of that. If you want to involve spatial effect, you get partial differential equations or stochastic partial differential equations models, which are important, um, say, in malaria, right? Because mosquitoes are, well, they don't travel a lot, let me put it that way, right? So spatiality becomes here um, more important than in uh, than other things. Influenza is actually... Um, yeah, there are some spatial models um, also around here. Then um, there are the agent-based model, which can involve spatial aspects or not. And um, usually they take place on a network of, um, of contacts, right? For, um, and the contacts are kind of random. And the first um, type, um, for the first type of diseases where this kind of type of models were used were actually with HIV. Um, epidemic models on random networks were discussed earlier, but real life applications also to do the lack, the previous lack of computer um, equipment um, actually started with HIV. And um, and has now, of course, extended into influenza and COVID and uh, some other, a lot of other diseases. And as I already said, um, the aim is in uncovering conditions for outbreaks, epidemic threshold. I will speak about this a little bit. Control and predictions of incidence and prevalence. So this is a prototype of a differential equations model, and you see why it's called compartment model because you partition somehow the population into the most important relevant group. And this um, partitioning is actually also used in the classification of, um, of diseases, right? So you have S, the susceptible, those who can get infected, then you have the infected groups, uh, which have are actively infected and can infect others. And then the R group are the removals, those who have been um, recovered and have a degree of immunity, right? And the D is the death groups, and the C here is the quarantine groups, and you have rates how um, uh, you go from one group into another groups, and this is described by differential equations. Usually you need quite strong homogeneity assumptions, um, so good mixture assumptions in the population to justify the applicability of this differential equations model. So this is a prototype. And um, I'm not sure, yeah, so here, as you see the, the malaria, um, if you look for the evolution of the malaria models, um, they are classified ag again in this group of compartment, according to the compartments you use. So the simplest um, epidemic models 
not in terms of mathematics, but um, well, in terms of categories are susceptible infected. So you get infected and you are a lifelong infectious. Um, this is true for HIV essentially, but also for infectious diseases like herpes. Then um, the most common used is um, the SIR. So after infections, you have a degree of immunity. And um, um, HIV is actually um, not really, um, I just think it's wrongly put here. I don't know, I just see it. Um, but there is uh, the, the measles, there is COVID-19, and um, to a certain extent, right? Of course, you lose immunity also, but if you are interested only in forecasting for half a year or a year, you can ignore that the uh, immune people those who have been infected in the past get again susceptible, that means can get infected again. So if you take allow for that, then you have a susceptible infected removal susceptible group, right? So after a certain time, again, you can, you can be infected. And then you have also a group where this R group just doesn't um, exist. Immediately after the infection, you can get infected again. And for a lot of um, mucosis um, infections, so if you um, gain a, a mushroom, right, um, and parasitic infections, you go, don't build up immunity. You can immediately get reinfected. Um, uh, in the medical literature, very often is used, and you maybe have heard it, the SEER model. So you have an exposure phase. Uh, you get infected, but you are not yet infectious. And um, so this is somehow the classification, the rough classification. But you see that you can, as more and more compartments you add, um, as more and more refined models you get, and this is the evolution of the malaria models, starting from the old paper by Ross here, and you see um, there is a lot of activity and you can still spend a lifelong um, um, academic career on just uh, building up and refining malaria models, right? Which is still an important and uh, um, from global health perspective, very relevant disease. Many people die of malaria still. Um, as a side remark, maybe um, there was in the, in the 60s um, of the last century, um, an attempt to eradicate malaria. And the plan which the WHO, the World Health Organization, made was actually based on certain malaria models. And um, so they, they really looked at the models and said, if we do, or the people who actually created the model told the WHO, if you do this and this and this, we can get rid of malaria globally. And that was a complete failure. Um, uh, the failure was in part due to, well, not refined enough models. And then the WHO were somehow a little bit suspicious when people came up with mathematical models and it wasn't for a long time used in, um, in health planning or in fighting infectious diseases um, because of this relatively poor outcome of the model um, Based strategy to fight malaria, right? Um, at least I was told this by people which were involved at that time in this process. Good. So um, we have these two group, big groups, ODE, differential equations, and agent-based. What are the pluses and the minuses of the model? Well, um, compartments model are usually very easy to describe. You just write down the differential equation, so a set of differential equations. And they are very easy to simulate. Just a personal a computer, a laptop is enough. You don't need a lot of computational power to do this. And they are also relatively easy to analyze, right? So key features, um, what is the dynamic states, what is the stability, what, is, uh, what parameter set provide you to an outbreak when the epidemics is subcritical, it's relatively easy to get them. Um, it's difficult to add heterogeneity, right? For instance, there is no model up to now which involves households in, in ODE model, 
um, I have a project with the Max Planck Institute in Göttingen actually to do some things, so um, a kind of insights from agent-based model to transport in the ODE models, um, because they have some advantages, as I said here. Now, um, on the agent-based model, essentially you can say what is a plus in the, um, in the compartment model is a minus in the agent-based model and vice versa, right? Um, so, heterogeneity is difficult in compartments model, but it's very easy to add in agent-based models, right? You just um, assign um, a lot of individual features to your agents and the features you can sample from some known or conjectured probability distributions. And um, you can rely on um, a lot of raw data, like uh, the census data, for instance, distribution of the population, spatial distribution, and um, directly implement, more or less mimic uh, the population in an almost one-to-one -one level into an agent-based model. The drawback is that you get a lot of parameters. And um, that is uh, always a problem when you, do, when, you, when you want to do good fitting, right? And also understanding. And the common wisdom is actually that those models are out of uh, scope and you, you can't really do mathematics on this model. And I will make a strong point, I try to make a good point here that this is not true. Um, but it's di more difficult than in the ODE case. And um, in our uh, minors in the agent-based model that they are computational expensive, right? So my colleague Martin Bodek spoke here a little bit. We use supercomputers um, for doing um, the simulations and um, if you want to really to have 40 million agents like representing the Polish population. Um, and that um, is the reason why um, despite the need now for relatively refined model in the COVID epidemics, many European countries don't have a big agent-based model, big in the sense that it represents really the entirely population. Germany, for instance, doesn't have one. Um, Great Britain has one. This was already created earlier um, with the main focus to be um, prepared if a new influenza comes in, a dangerous one like the Spanish flu. Um, um, Austria has one which is also used by the government um, uh, and um, I'm not sure about many all the other European countries uh, but um, uh, Poland has two agent-based models so we are relatively comfortable here. And the United States, I'm not, I don't think that they have agent-based model for the whole country, right? So um, 80 million people to simulate or the whole of Europe to do an agent-based is already really on the limit what you can do in a reasonable way. Of course, there's a lot of things you can either simplify or make more complicated. But if you really would like to let people move around, so like a random walk, of course, to, 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 to simulate mo real mobility, then you don't get to uh, such high, um, high um, numbers in the agents. Uh, this is just of the uh, possibilities we have on the computational side at the moment. So my colleagues in Leipzig, for instance, have um, an agent-based model where the people really move around. It has only 20,000 um, agents, but they need on the supercluster in Dresden already um, a couple of weeks to run here simulations, right? This can be very, very, very um, um, computationally expensive. Good. The most important number in epidemiology is the so-called reproduction number. And um, uh, that is a number you really have to understand um, when you want, to, the first thing you have to understand when you want to understand in epidemics, and the number is easily to define, it's, um, it's the number of, the mean number of secondary cases. And the reason for the importance of this number is because it divides somehow in epidemics into two phases, the subcritical and the overcritical phase. Subcritical means if you don't do anything, the epidemics would die out, at least in SIR epidemics, and the overcritical, then you go up and eventually you reach saturation. And it's 
pretty intuitive that this is a right criterion, right? If an average in infected infects more than one infected individual, then things go off. And if an average in infected, a typical infected infects less than one, then the things go down and eventually go extinct. And a special case, but this is um, rarely stable, one is the critical things when in, infected um, exactly in mean would infect uh, a new, one new case. Now, the problem with this definition is a little bit what is really meant with a typical infected, because typical infected is um, subject to well, to the how the epidemics involves and spreads over, say, different age groups or different um, subgroups in the population. Um, so it's not just the mean um, if you it would um, artificially initialize uh, or to pick up a hundred people in the population, initialize them with the infection and look how many they would infect. That is not the R0, because they would not necessarily present the typical distribution of infection in the population. And it's called R0 or R0 because you assume that all the um, contacts which those initially infected have, this initially typical infected have, are susceptible. Right? There is another number which is called the effective reproduction number, which takes also into account the likelihood that you meet a person or you are in contact with a person which is actually infected or has been um, just a short time ago been infected. And um, well, with this number at hand, you can already estimate a couple of things. I will not go here into the things, um, but on the right side, you see a picture of the R estimation and the many, many groups and also the government, also our government um, actually, or the health ministry estimates this R value. You can use a model or there are just statistical methods how to do this. And um, this is a key parameter to estimate, to say somehow what is the state of the epidemics. Be careful, on the right side, it's not the R0, it's the R effective here, right? Um, so taking into account also the likelihood that you um, have a contact with somebody who has immunity. All right. So um, epidemic models or networks, agent-based models, um, you have um, agents giving a lot of individual properties and you have maybe a type or agent feature dependent contact structure and the contacts are random. And you have an individual also maybe heterogeneous progression of the disease and everything can depend um, on time explicitly or implicitly because the environment changes and then you have still on the top of that a lot of complex countermeasures. So a relatively rich structure. Um, <coughs> um, to visualize this, um, you, use, you think in terms of graphs. And um, what I have depicted here, the right side is a real contact network, and you see you have, um, it doesn't look very homogeneous, you have groups which cluster and groups which have lesser contacts. Um, I'm actually not sure if this is a real social network or some uh, biological network, doesn't matter for the purpose of illustration here, you see it has um, a very inhomogeneous structure. And at the right side is a little snapshot what is um, in, from my view, also from our modeling view, um, a certain subgraph in the graph of contacts, and that is called the infection network or the infection graph. So um, imagine, and uh, you should think about epidemics in terms of this infection graph. What does infection graph mean? Assume that a person is infected, right? A person is represented by a vertex or a node, a black dot here on my little picture. And um, uh, those person has a set of contacts, but I don't draw all his contacts in. I only draw the contacts in if he would infect one of those contacts, okay? So a black line with an arrow here would be um, the contact of the person who is infected, which he also infects during the contact, 
right? So there might be, because we have not 100% infectivity, there might be contacts which you don't infect, and this you don't draw an edge here. And the direction, of course, tells you that um, where the infect infection comes from. And you assume in this process that all your contacts are susceptible. So that's why you can see a person can be three times infected, um, and then it depends on the timing when these contacts were actually realized who was the first one who was infecting him. But the important thing now is that the connectivity structure of those infection graphs tells you actually about the fate of the epidemics, right? So I repeat, think of all your contacts you have, imagine that you are infected, this is something which might happen in the future. And then you randomly sample, and that's why you get a random graph, um, those who you would actually really infect. If you do the sampling again, that would be another subgroup of your contacts. But remarkably, whatever the realization is, on the global scale, all these realizations look very similar, right? Which is... Um, a feature which many random objects have, if it involve a large number, somehow um, you have the deterministic laws um, for many, many observables or many, many things you are interested in. Of course, not who is really getting infected, but if you look how many people overall get infected, that's something which essentially is not longer a random thing. Now, the um, structural features of uh, such random networks um, were pioneered by two Hungarian mathematicians, uh, Paul Erdős and Alfred Rainies, and in the 50s they wrote a couple of seminal papers on, um, on what's now called the erdős rainy random graph model. And it is a very, very simple network. Um, you assume that um, you have only one free parameter and that is the, um, uh, the probability to, um, to have a contact between two nodes. And the interesting thing is if you don't have too many edges. Um, so it means if you are in the domain where the number of edges is proportional to the size of the population, the number of nodes, and um, uh, then this probability translates essentially to one number, the mean number of neighbors you have, where neighborhood is defined in the sense of um, having an edge, a common edge, right? Two nodes or neighbor nodes, if there is an edge between them. And um, they've observed that actually you have a very, very remarkable uh, phase transition when this connectivity, the mean number of friends or neighbors you have in this graph is one. If, um, and here the three pictures below um, show actually this situation. If the mean number of neighbors in this network is just a little bit less than one, the graph splits into very large number of small connected components. Right? They look, most of these components look like trees, but there is, um, they are disjoint, right? Um, if you go a little bit above one, um, still you have a large number of small connected components, which are tree-like, but there is also one large connected component, which gets bigger and bigger as the mean number of neighbors um, increases. And this is called the giant component. And this is really a phase transition. It's very closely related to, um, um, to what you see when you cook a pudding, right? Uh, so, gelation pro in gelation processes. And actually, they use the Erdős Rainy model to describe gelation processes. You, you steer your, um, your, your pudding that you want to cook. And at a given point of time, it gets stick, right? So it means the molecules connect to each other and, um, and um, you get one big cluster of um, well, atoms or molecules which are stick together. Um, I had previously a slide where actually I presented a little bit about this. 
um, there was a Polish physicist, Smolochowski, at the beginning of the 19th century, which pioneered the physics or the science of gelation. And, um, and this is somehow a little bit a predecessor also on certain epidemic um, uh, features. Anyway, this two guy um, laid a lot of, um, found out a lot of uh, basic mathematical property around this phase transition and described the structure in this very simplistic models um, very well. This is just the same picture as before, just a little bit larger, um, mean number of neighbors a little bit less than one, um, only um, small connected component, most of them tree-like, a little bit uh, larger mean number of neighbors than one, and you get one big cluster of connected nodes. And if you and if you still increase, this quickly eats up all the nodes, and they all get um, connected to this cluster. Now, if you think that the edges here represent um, edges in the sense of the infection graph, as I previously have shown, then um, you can under you understand that once a single node in this big cluster here, say in the middle picture, gets infected, the infection spreads over to all the nodes in this connected component. So um, the total number of people who will get infected is precisely the size of the connected components where the initial infectin infection lies, okay? Um, that is somehow the important uh, importance for the, um, for the epidemic processes. Now, this game, um, which is played here on a, um, on a graph or random networks, you can also play on different types. Um, the whole the theory for this is uh, runs under the name of percolation theory, right? Um, so imagine you have um, a spatial configuration, nodes like on a lattice um, arranged, and you have randomly um, edges to the neighbors. You have just four neighbors. And again, there is here a phase transition. Um, if the likelihood of having a connection to one of your neighbors is above one half, actually, then you will have um, an infinite or very large connected component. And um, this is called the percolation threshold. Um, traditionally, it um, describes, has a lot of application in physics, it describes the diffusion to, through porous media, and uh, the porosity here is actually a parameter which can be linked to the probability to have an open or closed edge um, to one of your neighbors. If you are interested, I really uh, recommend uh, the nice Wikipedia article about percolation theory. What I said before, you can see as percolation theory on random networks. And that is what most of the epidemics is actually about. Okay? So, um, uh, the erdos renin model is a little bit too simplistic. So, we would like to push up um, this model and add more features. And of course we have, um, so I would like to have different types of individuals and different infection states. And I would like to have contacts which depend on features, right? Contacts between a 20 years old and an 80 years old person is much less likely than a contact to somebody in your own age groups or um, contacts um, among working people um, depend on your uh, working status, right? Whether you're employed or not employed, uh, whether you go to school and so on, you can immediately, um, of course, understand that um, a lot of features make contacts with a group of people which don't have these features very unlikely or impossible. So um, the graph becomes heterogeneous, okay? And, um, and then you have still transmission probabilities to finally define what I called previously the infection graph. So here's an example on the right side. And the extension of this erdos rainy model um, was done again in a seminal paper by Bolobash Janssen-Riordan in 2005, 
it's um, a very nice paper because they almost the whole theory of erdos um phase transitions, they could extend. The paper is pretty long. It's 140 pages long, and it's a pure math paper. Um, but the type of graph they have here is um, at least conceptually very easy to define. As I said before, you assign features to, it's a vector of numbers, say, to the individuals. And these features can either randomly or um, deterministically assigned. Important is, um, do you have an asymptotic limiting distribution of the features, right, if the population is large? And um, then the probability to have an edge between an individual i and j, which their specific individual feature vectors, um, is described by a function, a kernel function, and then you still divide by n because you want to have still a sparse graph, right? Real social networks are sparse in the sense that the number of contacts is proportional to the population size. It's proportional, um, the, 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 your individual numbers of contact doesn't depend on the population size, so the whole contact in the network is proportional to the population size. But um, you have still, in average, a number of contacts which doesn't depend whether you live in a country with 40 millions or 80 millions or 200 millions, right? Because um, it's bounded by your social capabilities. On the right side here, the colors would indicate different types of individuals here, different features. And you see, um, as more bluish you become, as less likely you have contacts with the ones who are red colored. And um, this builds in a lot of heterogeneity, uh, which you actually would like to have if you want to model real life networks. Okay. So you put all the heterogeneities in the features you assign and then in the way how you link probabilities to have contacts um, on the basis of these features. So here are a few features which you can assign to the individuals and uh, which are relevant for the contact, socioeconomic properties, I mentioned already age and gender, profession, education, work status, and the household size but also features of the epidemics itself. And I think Martin spoke about um, the MOCOS model a little bit about this already. Um, you can assign already a priori, right? For the a number of people you will infect, so for the infection graph, it's important how long you are infectious. This is a random feature, but you can sample it from a distribution previously before they actually you get infected. You can somehow decide how long you will be infected. And the same goes with tested, not tested, hospital stay, and so on. Um, there's a lot of things you can actually assign as features in the individuals, and they are relevant for the epidemics. Now, the local structure of such type of graphs, heterogeneous um, random graphs, which um, I meant maybe I have to make this point still, um, a very important part here is that the edges are made independent. They are not identically, so the probability of an edge between i and j um, uh, is uh, maybe a different one if I, if you look for individual i with contact with individual k, but whether you have an edge between i and j has no impact um, on, the, um, on the probability or on the event to have um, an edge with another person, right? So assume independence between the edges, a very crucial feature to gain mathematical grounds here. Now, with this type of models, the local structure of graphs, and that is a consequence of this independence assumptions, is essentially tree-like. Now, we all know that real networks are not of this type, um, and the household is at least an example, but there are good arguments why you should be ignorant um, for a moment on that. And if we can, if somebody is interested, we can go into discussion here. So the local structure looks like a tree. So on the top here is an individual, and you show who is in distance one, and who is in distance two, and distance three, and so on. And I drawn already, this kind of um, local configuration in a, a large 
um, heterogeneous random graph in a, um, as you would, um, so this looks like a branching process. So a process where somehow an individual creates new individuals and they create new, again into individuals and um, you can call them generations. Generations mean here how distant you are in the graph. Um, well, generation five is at distance five to the first person on the top here. Okay, so um, this local structure can be generated by what's called a branching process, right? And um, the, um, and there is an extended TL theory which goes back then more than 100 years, 150 years almost, is a theory um, how this random tree-like structures can be generated and how their features are. And that's called branching processes, okay? The first branching processes were actually discussed um, by Galton and Watson, um, two uh, British scholars in the second half of the 19th century, when they wanted to answer the important question at that time, how likelihood is the extinction of aristocratic names in Great Britain, in the British Empire? So they used a model of this type to understand, to, 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 well, to come up with the likelihood of getting ex that the name gets extinct. Um, now, in our setting here, it's a little bit more complicated because we have this a lot of different types here, and there is one mathematical quantity, and it's called the transfer operator, which actually tells you um, how the the, contact, the linkage structure of the associated branching process, right? So, um, in a certain sense, this operator, and that is called by its transfer operator, tells you if I have a certain distribution, a function here, an observable, let's call it f, in one generation, um, uh, this could be the features um, or um, something you are just um, you are just interested in. How this transfers, these features or these observables transfer to the next generation, right? So it's a kind of um, conditional expectation you can view it. And uh, um, the way how it's, um, uh, it, this expectation is modified is via the kernel which defines the contact structure, right? So this, uh, in this integral, this um, kernel here times the distribution of the the d mu y, uh, which is distribution of the feature, defines itself a new, the induced distribution of feature in from one generation to the next one. Or let's say from, a, you start with individual type y, how, what the features are in his next generation. Um, so, and then you do the observation, which is encoded by the f. So it's a kind of conditional expectation here. Well, Good. Um, the important point is that this reproduction number I spoke previously about is actually linked now to the norm of this operator. And it's actually exactly the same thing. So if the um, in the symmetric case, you can use the L2 norm. Um, if this norm in the asymmetric case, it would be the spectral norm. If this norm is larger than 1, that corresponds to the reproduction number R0 larger than 1. And actually, it is the reproduction number. It needs a proof to do this. But um, uh, this is really the typical, um, the, the mean number of, a, of secondary cases produced by a typical infected individual. And if this number is less than 1, all the components, the connected components, are small. And interestingly, there is a formula to compute the size of this giant component. And it's a nonlinear formula here. I will maybe not go into the details here. But um, uh, um, this formula tells you the likelihood of a type X individual to be in the giant component. And it involves this, so it's a nonlinear um, uh, integral equation here. Um, but it has nice numerical features, so you can solve it, and then you integrate over x, and then you get the expected size in terms of fraction of the whole population of the giant component, and that means you get the expected size 
um, of the total number of individuals which get infected if you inject um, a group of infected in the population. This number is a random number, but if n goes to infinity, it converges to, um, to something non-random, right? So um, the, it, this number is local, the true number of the size of the giant component is localized around the obtained by this red formula here on the bottom line. Good. So, um, again, as before, you have the three domains of epidemics, and you can get to actually say something, how large the epidemic becomes, once you know this, um, this, um, well, this so-called transfer operator. Good. Um, there's a directed extension of the whole theory, which I will not tell you, and um, let me immediately come to something which is not in the bolabash jansen framework, and that are the households. And I will tell you how you can involve, actually, in this. Let me say a few words on households, because this is really an important issue. Um, households are not involved in the classical um, theory here, um, or at least this in this modern theory, um, because you households are little cliques, right? So the individuals group together into clusters in the household and um, they have, it's not a tree-like structure. So here's the effect of um, a household. Um, so you group these individuals together and uh, making, for instance, little triangles or additional bonds if you have two people, two person households. And um, uh, the right thing, how to extend the previous theory into a theory which involves household to consider households as vertices. As in, so you, general, you take households as generalized individuals and you actually look on how the connectivity between households is. Okay? So you should view the epidemics as an epidemics between, not between individuals, but an epidemics between households. And a household is longer infected than an individual, say, and it um, has some complicated intrinsic structure still, um, how the infection progresses in the household, all right? But it's now important um, that, and this is somehow the, one of the key points here, if you have two single households, well, the likelihood that they have an edge in common, say an infectious edge, is the same as um, two individuals previously had. But if you have a three-person household and a four-person household, the number of contacts, so the likelihood that there is an edge now in your household graph, which edges represent connections between the household, the probability that this happens is proportional to the number of possible contacts you have between these two households. And you see immediately that a household of size 3 and a household of size 5, the probability is proportional to 3 times 5, to 15. So you have a 15 times higher chance that a 3 and a 5, 4 person house, sorry, 3 times 4 is 12, a 12 times higher chance that a 3 and a 4 size household have an edge in common, so it means a contact or an infectious contact uh, is happening than between two single households. So it, the product um, of the household sizes enters into the probability of having a contact. Okay, so let's take things simple here. Think in the erdos rainy graph. You can extend it easily to the Erdos, to the, to the bolobash jansen framework and group the individuals now according to households. Now, if an infection comes in a household, not everybody in the household gets infected. So you have still usually an, what's called an attack rate. And, um, well, the two years of observations in epidemics somehow suggest that this attack rate is, um, at least for the alpha and the delta variant, around 0.2. So in mean, only 20% of your household members get infected. Delta is a little bit higher. Alpha is around 0.2. The first uh, original variant was a little bit less. So, but this is an important quantity here. And then you still have the household size distribution. Okay, and E is now in my saying here, the expected number of households. 
Now, you have to write down, um, again, a kernel which takes the household sizes into account. So X and Y is now the only feature I have in this simplified network here, which is the household size, right? Instead of individuals with features, it still would matter here, but just to, for didactical reason, I present it that way. Um, it only depends on the household size and the probability between households of sites X and Y to get an infection transported is proportional to exactly what is written here. So it's proportional to Y, how many, so X gets in, is a household which get infected. So you have the one here, the one infected. And then with the likelihood, with the household attack rate, you have infect the remaining. That is the expected number of people which get infected. And um, the Y household, well, everybody could get infected. Um, then comes the C in, which is the infection probability. And um, so this gives you the likelihood to be, uh, to have an infectious edge between this infected household of size X to a not yet infected household of size Y. And the reason why you have to divide by E here is because um, the, um, if you go to the household graph, you have less nodes. Right, so the household that the, if you have n individuals, 40 million um, individuals, say for Poland, and everybody would live in mean or in mean, the people would live in three households, three person households, then you would have 40 divided by three households, right, in, in terms of expectation. And then you have a transfer operator here, and you can compute the norm. And that is what the last line five here is um, actually about. And you see that the second moment, so the mean square number of the squared household size and um, divided by the expected household size goes actually as the key factor in. And C is the out household reproduction number here in that case. So the households act like a boost of the normal reproduction number because you don't have protection inside the household. If the attack rate would be zero, it wouldn't matter, right? Um, but if the, as higher the attack rate may are, as more you get a boost of the epidemics due to the households. And Poland has this ratio here, which is now becoming crucial, is very high in Poland. Um, it's almost, well, it's not exactly twice, but it's really much, much larger than the German ones, okay? Um, so here is um, the heterogeneity also in regions on household sizes. The second moment is here plotted. You see that some parts in Poland have very large household sizes or especially large squared household sizes. And um, that is something you can now do a little bit. Um, uh, so um, this, I would, let me explain this picture because this is an, um, still an ongoing research project here. Um, in these pictures, we looked at the deaths, including the excess deaths, um, by May, late May um, 2021. Why late May and not um, last end of last year? Because then the vaccination came in, and the vaccination changes actually the household sizes, the effective household sizes. If you have immune people due to vaccination in the household, it's effectively a shrinking of the households. But at that time, till May, the, uh, in the, the epidemics was not yet really so much in fact affected by the, um, by the vaccination. Now, um, so we looked for the deaths, and then we assumed, and it's a little bit rough, we are, that is the picture actually where you get in two days an update here. Um, we have approximately an infection fatality rate of 1%. This is not entirely true because it depends on the country's age distribution of the population, but for this purpose here, um, we just used it as 1%. So among 100 randomly scattered infections, one person dies. Now, assuming this, you can take the deaths, and including the excess death, to scale up to conjectured number of total infected, which have been um, well, with the epidemics generated up to that time, end of May 2021. And um, now on the x-axis here is this moment ratio plotted. 
And the blue line, the blue dots actually, um, would be the predicted value of the prevalence. Um, I don't have shown you the formula for that, but you can now go on with the theory and use the bollabach jansen theory to estimate the size of the epidemics um, which would happen if you do a certain degree of restrictions, okay? And you do here the mean European restrictions um, of the epidemic. So this is the blue line. If we would do what the average Europe did in average, you would end up um, at that number of infections um, in a given country. So what you see here, some countries did better than the mean and some countries did worse of the mean. But there is also a clear trend as higher the household size, or especially this ratio, the squared household size divided by household size becomes, as more difficult is actually to control your epidemics and you get number higher number of infected. So Poland is here one of the highest um, of the worst in terms of the structural parameter. Whereas Germany, Denmark and Finland um, are on the lower part here and have much, much have conditions much in favor to control the epidemics, right? Now, Poland still did worse um, than the mean here. So there's not only uh, that we have um, drive up of uh, infections due to the household sizes, but also the performance, uh, the restrictions were less in total. Um, if you take age corrections into account, it becomes still more visible here. But I want to say that you can do now um, and go and try to somehow separate how large is the effect of restrictions and how large is the effect of the structural parameter household size distribution on the epidemics. Now, um, this goes here a little bit in the detail. I will send you the slides so you can read it, and I just skip over this here. So maybe Martin already showed this. If um, you can compare Poland and Germany and Great Britain and switch um, between those countries, um, and actually if... Um, um, so the, the restrictions in Poland, Great Britain, at least until then time, were similar. But Poland got a um, much higher number of infected um, uh, and, and then Great Britain. And this difference is mainly due to household size differences. This is not longer true in the fourth wave, right? This Great Britain did much, much more restrictions than Poland. Um, and um, this is interesting. I think it's an important insight here, which the theory provides. And I will um, skip over this a little bit further. And... Um, say still a few words about the real timing. Um, now, all what I was saying here was structural aspect. How long is the giant component? How long, um, how many people get infected eventually? Um, but the real epidemics, you would like, of course, like in the forecourts, how do things go on? And um, that means you have assigned to the edge, to an infectious edge, still the time, how long it takes that the infection jumps over from one person to another one. And models of this types are called first passage percolation. Do you think like you travel along the edges or the infection travels along the edges and it takes a certain time to travel to pass over an edge. So to pass from one person to, the, to another person which was infected by the first person. Okay, and it's a random number, it's a distribution. That theory is called first passage percolation. You can do it on lattices or on random graphs. And um, now, local tree structure is still there. The branching process is now a continuous time branching process. And um, it's very well understood since more than 50 years how the distribution of this travel time so this, what's called in epidemics, the generation time, right? Um, how this distribution affects the spread of the infection, so the growth rate. The growth rate is traditionally um, described by a parameter which is called the Malthusian parameter. And um, uh, there is a um, relation between the distribution of this travel times or the generation time and the growth rate of an epidemics. Essentially, it's involving the Laplace transform of this. So this is equation nine here. And this is a well-known theorem. 
Um, but things becoming a little bit more complicated if you have heterogeneous graphs, the bolo jansen riordan graphs. Here, I don't give you this information here, but I just want to show you there is um, a very recent 2018 result on a subclass of graphs like the bolo jansen riordan graph here, which tells you precisely what is the mean distance in terms of this travel time along edges between two nodes? And if you have, and there's a remarkable result which um, Bamidi, Hofstadt, and Hogemstra get in 2018 is that um, this random number, so the mean distance in travel time, start the infection in node I, and you would know how long it takes that node J gets infected. Right, so the epidemic starts at one node, goes off, the whole connected component gets infected. How large the connected component is, I computed before, or at least is a theory you can compute, and now you would know how long it takes. And if you have this distribution of this number, then you know everything essentially. Then you know the whole curves of the epidemics. And they got it for a, a subclass of this type of models. And actually, it's localized around the logarithm of the distribution. Um, so the first quantity here is not of importance, that is, uh, but the second term in this bracket is the, um, the, the shortest travel time, Ln, right? So this is the relevant quantity. So the mean distance in terms of how long it takes that you in, in node i get starting in node i and node j gets infected, is concentrated about the logarithm of n divided by the Malthusian parameter alpha here. Um, and um, uh, so it means if the population size gets larger and larger, the shape of the epidemics becomes more and more a delta curve. It's not a bell-shaped. It becomes almost a delta, right? So. Um, but there is an explicit um, uh, expression for this distribution. And this distribution here is a sum of three random variables, which um, at least numerically you have good control here. One is the, the, fluctu the, the W is somehow are the fluctuation in the branching process. And you have to involve your two branching processes, a backward and a forward one. And then the lambda here is a Gumbel distribution. So essentially, this formula 10 here is almost like an analytic representation of the solution to a very highly nonlinear and highly complex epidemic process, right? It's, um, and that is really, I think, um, a major, a major result in the whole theory. And I'm with some colleagues are actually now to about to extend this, 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 this theorem um, to the more uh, complex clause of um, directed uh, bolobash jansen riordan graphs, right? So this is here the um, still conjecture. We haven't yet uh, written this up. Good. Um, uh, now, let me end my talk um, with um, some problems. I mean, you have a little bit, maybe this is for the discussion also. We have um, problems related to policy advice. <laughs> um, uh, we have sometimes a fundamental lack of basic epidemiological understanding about decision makers. Um, there are wrong requests and wrong decisions, and there's a lot of visual thinking there, I can guarantee you, after having almost two years regular conversation with uh, the Ministry of Health. And decisions are very often delayed till the last moment, if they come at all. Uh, we don't have a proper risk prevention strategy. There is a selective bias to optimistic scenarios. So they are happy if some modelers come up with an optimistic one and they um, stay with this optimistic long as long as real till the point the reality really proves it to be wrong. And also among the experts, uh, you have a lot of overconfidence in the in the, in the predictions. Um, you have a lack of good data and as non-transparent restriction structures and then um, political parties and governments are subject to the impact of public opinion or what they believe is the public opinion, to name just a few problems. Um, now, in MOCOS, we do a lot of um, things like heat maps, which are essentially scanning the parameter space and looking for the outcome of the epidemics. A good part of this heat maps you could do theoretically. Once we would have, say, a proof of this formula here. 
And um, that is ongoing research. And um, uh, now, um, yeah, as a lot of things here you can read in my slides, I don't want to prolong maybe this aspect. Just want to say Poland has um, a severe problem with um, an ex extraordinary high number of excess deaths, so the blue curves are the real deaths. And just to, because we have a research project which estimates this excess deaths, because from the excess deaths you can estimate the prevalences and then you can understand how large the impact of the household structure is. So this is all linked project and you see we had in Poland almost 190,000 COVID deaths up to now. Um, quite a lot more than the 110,000, which are the official numbers. And uh, Poland is here one of the worst uh, countries in um, European, uh, among the European countries. Good. Um, let me close with a nice picture, which I like to show. Um, that was the two, 9,000, uh, the, the Spanish flu in 1918. Um, two country states here, two cities in the US, uh, Philadelphia and St. Louis. And St. Louis did restrictions immediately um, two days after the first case they found, social distancing. Philadelphia delayed it um, uh, by uh, much more, September 17, first case, um, so two weeks later, restrictions. And you see um, how badly Philadelphia performed and how well St. Louis performed. So timing, early reaction is crucial here. They had already masked at that time. There were the people who favored the mask and want to put others into jail. And there were the anti-mask meetings at the time also. So nothing new under the sun. And I think that's maybe a good point to end my talk and um, awaiting your questions. Sorry for having a bit taken more time than planned. Thank you, Professor, for your presentation. Great overview, rich with details and uh, yeah, great work. Uh, so yeah, now discussion open. If anyone has any questions, comments, please just unmute yourself and speak up. Maybe I will start because one question, not maybe directly related to mathematical details, but to, to your project in a way. Uh, Mocos group, uh, that's, uh, as you mentioned several times, you have a lot of ongoing research projects. How many of those are still running? What are the prospects here? You are, you think this group will produce uh, New 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 forecasts uh, will be running agent models for next two years, something like yeah, this. Yeah, I mean, that, that <laughs> as long as long as the epidemics is still um, not not over, uh -huh. and you have the risk definitely for the autumn. I'm, nobody if, knows what will happen there when we have waning immunity. The vaccination immunity goes off. The um, the Omicron immunity gained by those who have been infected now um, is is off and there could be a return of Delta, it could be new car variants. We still have um, maybe two million cases or more in the worldwide. Um, we still have um, a large number of deaths um, worldwide, right? Uh, so we are after two years in the epidemics, um, if you take um, excess deaths into account, we are maybe above 10 million deaths. Uh, officially, we are coming closer to six, but oh. that is on the scale of the World War I. Um, so it's really um, uh, a worldwide catastrophe. Um, and um, it might be that like the Spanish flu, everything goes, um, goes away um, in next half year. It remains to see, but we plan at the moment, I mean, what we plan, and it's coming back to your questions, definitely to have forecast um, for the for the next months and as soon as things becoming again um, worse um, we will update this but um, there is now also a little bit um, less stress on weekly producing reports and forecast uh, which consumed uh, we do it for Saxony we do it for 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 Poland which consumed a lot of time and I think um, as same with many of my colleagues, we will now focus on analysis, what really happened, 
and part of the things I showed you go actually in the direction to understanding epidemics on a deeper level and uh, writing papers and articles on that. So we have a project on comparing mm -hmm. deaths and prevalences over the whole of Europe um, and in the United States states and link them with structural risk factors like household. This is in joint work with the Max Planck Institute in Göttingen. We have some projects going on on spatial stochastic um, dynamics, um, also with the University of Göttingen, the University of Frankfurt, and also in collaboration with the ICM in Warsaw. Um, we have, um, uh, well, a little bit still involved if Przemysław um, Piacek's um, um, project of uh, patient outcome estimation, but I'm personally also interested because I did it for some time for HIV in host modeling. And um, there is now, we got a grant, or at least we are a part of a, of a big uh -huh. grant from Germany um, on heterogeneity um, in epidemics. And actually the plan is to build up a model for the Asian-based model for Germany a little bit similar to our models, but with much more features still involved over the next um, three years. Um, so there is, um, uh, you can, uh, I'm maybe not happy in spending all my remaining life <laughs> on epidemics. There are still a lot of other things. I have a language project and I have some social science projects still and some purely mathematical projects, but still I'm, this year, I'm probably pretty much busy with the epidemics and whether it intensifies or fades a little bit away, this remains to see. Great, great. Thanks for your answer, for shedding some light here. So uh, maybe continuing a bit on that, uh, uh, from the last slides you just uh, presented, I guess your group or you are um, uh, communicating your results to officials, to policymakers, kind of. Right. Great. What was it the question already or? Yeah, yeah. I mean, just <laughs> if I understood you cor correctly, so you just said. <laughs> yes, that's right. I mean, we have here, um, I mean, more or less uninterrupted. Um, we have a weekly meeting with the Ministry of Health. Um, um, so, and that is an important direct contact. First of all, I mean, there are <clears throat> the ECM, um, so this other agent based model also involved, and most representatives of, of um, uh, institutions on health service. And we have a relatively on their reserve in, in our up to two hours, depending on the situation, to discuss really forecast and certain aspects. Now, this is not a decision-making um, position mm -hmm. that we are, just we, 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 but it's the discussion are relatively open and sometimes a little bit heated. And that has, um, uh, but that has to be proven, I mean, at least interesting that you see how certain things come up and um, a little bit warned. Now, Poland, as I said, by various reasons, I don't want to blame here um, the, the, the the Ministry of, of Health, um, uh, at least not directly, yeah. So um, because he is also bound to certain to certain um, other decision makers, and um, but um, taking a resume um, for the whole performance of Poland in the epidemics, we have. Um, a, in case we acted, this action was relatively tough and good. So we, um, the second wave um, and the third wave um, were more or less stopped by state intervention. And the countermeasures Poland took, and especially also in the first wave, were relatively rigid. So on the same level as Germany, I would say, they stopped the epidemics. The problem was, was a too long waiting. And as I showed with my last yeah. example from Philadelphia, St. Louis, two weeks makes a big difference if you have something which grows exponentially. Um, you get already in the high numbers when, um, uh, when you start say, well, I see a few thousand cases, but two weeks later, it's a few 10,000 cases already. And that is the reason why we have so many deaths in Poland. 
um, because we let um, the things um, a little bit too long go off. Um, now, with the Omicron, it was not long or such a problem because the death rate went really so massively down. But um, we have in the second, the third, and the fourth phase substantial excess deaths here in Poland, and have um, and the reason that 90% of the reason why Poland has so many deaths, it's not that the population has less good health conditions. It's not that the hospitals are worse or the doctors are worse. It's because we have too many. We had so many infections in Poland compared to other countries, right? And um, the, um, the reason for this is twofold. It's not only that we have a little bit too late reacted, the people have been also ignorant about our substructurally disadvantage by the large households here in Poland. That's why I'm stressing this point so much. This, um, that of course, all the theory took a little bit time, but we have warned already um, in 2020 um, that this might be a structural risk factor in Poland. And um, yeah, it was, um, it, it, it just they waited too long. And then the things are difficult to stop and you get high numbers. So um, now Poland is not an exception here. It has, um, uh, it has done not definitely not the best and one could do better. And I think one could have avoided half or um, even more of the deaths we have. That is um, a failure of policy. Um, but they are in good company with many other European countries. France did also not very well. Great Britain did also not perform very well. Some of the Scandinavian countries, except Sweden, did relatively good, like Denmark, um, the smaller countries, maybe it's easier to control. Islands did in general a little bit better because probably also to the lesser impact on, 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 on traffic and so on. The United States, it just won catastrophe. They didn't, uh, they have a million deaths and probably the excess deaths, including it's still more. So um, the only countries which um, managed well in the epidemics were Asian countries. Um, foremost China, whether you are a friend of China or not, it doesn't matter, but what they did in terms of epidemic control is uh, was par excellence, I would say, right? Um, and um, the numbers, if you go for the scientific, for the accuracy of numbers, taking away the first two months, there is no numbers I would trust more than the Chinese numbers right now, right? They have the most accurate counting, I would say, from all the countries. Right? They have not much epidemic still going on yet. But um, so uh, the, the Asian countries did better. And the reason for that is probably they were, um, one of the reasons is they had a different example in mind when this epidemic started, and that was SARS, um, uh, the, um, uh, which was a shock in Asia, in Hong Kong. And this, they said, well, this doesn't look like a flu, it looks like SARS. Now, SARS is much worse. It has a much, much higher mortality rate than the COVID. Okay. And um, so they were afraid of that. And we have seen it from the beginning and for a much too long time as a flu, just as a bad flu. And there are still people who believe in that to, still today. To today. But um, in general, the performance was, um, was, was a lot of mistakes were made. Um, there were also made the mistakes made in detail, um, which uh, I don't want to list here all of them. But overall, Europe, with uh, some exceptions, um, did, not, um, did not very good. There are countries which did much worse still than Poland. And here I would like to name a few. This is Bulgaria. Um, this is Hungary, and um, uh, and I think Czechia also, um, especially in the second wave and the third wave. Uh, so these were the countries which really they have much much smaller households. They could have done better, but they really um, well they didn't they didn't get it. I have a question. Um, mm -hmm because you focused uh, in your lecture about household 
uh, size and that this has a huge influence on the um, development of epidemic. And do you measure um, the influence of schools and workplaces? Yeah, sure. Um, workplaces, and this is a very legitimate and actually a very important aspect, um, this is also another structural factor. Now, um, if you look for the epidemiological data, and uh, Sanepid um, collected it for some time, the Robert Koch Institute still is doing it, you have usually about some information how large the share of infection due to certain context is, right? So how many workplace infections you have among all the known infections, how many were household infections, and how many were infections um, in in our uh, circumstances like school, but school I would consider as workplaces for children, um, uh, that they function like workplaces, of course, with specificities which are due to school circumstances. Now, the general uh, picture you, you have is one third is household, one third is, is workplace, and the other third scatters over friends, um, um, spontaneous infections, say, in a shopping center, which you can't really um, figure out, right? So this is usually where people say, I don't know where I got infected. Um, and so the, all the rest accumulates, restaurant or things like that, all the rest accumulates in the number third. So, but workplaces, at least a third of the infections are workplace infections. That matters um, because in workplaces you can do something. And um, and here the state's policy uh, was is really important because you can uh, force workplaces either to go into home office or to make regular testing, or to offer at least um, people regular testing. You can close workplaces once you have a single infection um, and put them under quarantine, or somehow close the workplace. And then it's a question um, of financial compensation, for instance. I know of many cases in Poland where small um, enterprises have um, had an infection, but the owner um, really pressured um, on the uh, employee not to um, become an officially recognized case uh, because he was afraid of closure of the company because he wouldn't get um, adequate uh, compensation. That our countries did better. Of course, it depends on the economic situation. Now, school test schools, a long time, all the pediatric um, fraction always says, well, um, schools are no driver of the epidemics. Of course, schools have an important impact. Um, this is known since uh, a long time for um, for infectious diseases like uh, flu or the common cold, and uh, COVID is not different here. The problem is, um, or the the, the the thing is that the children don't get really sick very much, right? It's rare. It's relatively rare, but they still have long COVID. The recent studies. Um, from um, which came up just last in the last in the last half year, I would say on long COVID, have uh, shown that also um, between ten percent, ten to fifteen percent of the children suffer from long COVID. So loss of concentration, um, long-standing problems below the line that it's really a hospital case, um, but still uh, the well-being of children is at least for one in 10 infected uh, um, for a long time um, diminished by the COVID infection. And um, so you can do a lot. We also have simulations, opening schools, closing school, testing school twice per week, once per year, and especially in Germany, because they have a strong testing policy in school. They tested in Saxony, for instance, schools three times per week, everybody, right? Um, uh, and um, uh, and then once you have three cases accumulated in the whole school, the whole school get closes. And um, so these are things which are really helpful. And um, well, we have done it a little bit more coarse grained, but um, school closures have been also put, as you all know, in Poland in action. And this was important. This was a good thing to do. I usually recommend it to do school closure earlier. Despite the lack of, um, well, maybe we 
get a little bit more stupid um, by having the children for some months not teach or half a year. But this is um, an acceptable uh, suffering um, in comparison to the number of deaths um, we otherwise would have or, will, or had had. Now, one word still on the deaths. It, uh, some people say, well, these are old people which are dying. It's true. Um, it's um, mostly the people above 60 or above 55, uh, which, which, which form 90% of the death cases. But if you look, and um, our countries have done it more carefully, um, on how many life years in average you have lost, right? So taking really the status of the disease, what is the life expectancy in this age group with this conditioning, it's in average um, 10, 11 years of life, a typical COVID death um, has lost or created, right? So the person would have in average um, 10 years more um, to live. And that is not just a little bit, that's a lot. And um, you see this, that life expectancy, the, the average over the whole, expect uh, whole country dropped, I mean, um, back to almost like war times in the United States and some other countries. So um, it's not only the very old people who are dying, it's also the people which will, would still live 10, 15, um, 20 years maybe, some may be a bit shorter, some may be a little bit longer. So it's a big suffering. And here I think um, the psychological problems we have with school closures are minor in comparison to saving lives. Yes, thanks for the response. So indeed it looks Ah, <laughs> interesting, let's say. Uh, but I, I have yet another, um, okay, to the audience. If you would like to ask a question, you can either speak up or just write it on the chat. Uh, I have maybe a question regarding uh, technical feasibility. That was something a bit on the very beginning, but probably I forgot. What are the technical limit? Uh, you mentioned something like this, I believe, for running agent-based models. You said like 80 million agents, something like this? No, Is that no, I wouldn't. I mean, it depends a little bit how 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 clever you do the things mm -hmm. and um, on what you give up. Um, so letting people move around really, um, did this did you come? This doesn't work, right? So this mm -hmm. you have to somehow um, give up with. Um, I mean, still, you can still do it, um, but um, it's not It's not really, um, I mean, really moving around in a kind of um, that you go down to like a town level and you move the, simulate the motion, um, to going to a shop, going to a supermarket, going to the workplace, using public transport, uh, losing a car, using a car and so on. There are mobility models which work on the city size, right? I think maybe half a million you can do, but this is already a, a very large project. I know some colleagues in Germany have this kind of mobility models uh, for Colonia is one, but this is really on the limit of what you can do. This doesn't work for 80 millions. Um, now, 80 millions definitely you can still run, and uh, we have a German sample population, we can do at least, um, we, we can do something here, but um, yeah, it's it's a compromise that you have to find, and um, the um, to simulate whole Europe. I mean, first of all, it's probably better to split it into the countries. The, uh -huh. the and I think it's two hundred million is still maybe um, at least split it because then you can parallelize. Um, this is still doable, or the, the whole European Union. The problem is you don't have the necessary. Um, detailed uh, data information um, as we have it, for instance, for Poland, because access to GUS data, and we have it for Germany on a better scale due to the micro sensors. But some other, not other countries have this, or if they have this, we don't have access to. So this would be actually called for a more European project also to, to unite, to make somehow the different models compatible. But I'm skeptical on that because you see scientists are um, and as more known they are, as more um, 
self-confident they are that their model is somehow superior about other mm. models. I'm not a being. I'm not being an exception here, and um, and um, and then um, so with a lot of alpha guys sitting together, it usually doesn't come to a good cooperation. Okay, thanks for the response. Um, I'm not sure if, if you can hear me. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, and what are your uh, thoughts about uh, COVID uh, becoming endemic, especially um, in the context of recent uh, events in Ukraine and uh, kind of the situation, um, kind of uh, being, I think, in the minds of uh, at least Europeans, more important and more pressing than COVID. Mm -hmm. Um, so first on the Ukraine, we have import of cases. Ukraine had um, um, had well in terms of numbers, it looks a little bit similar. I don't have done detailed analysis outside for our the non EU, EU countries here. So one would have to look a little bit on the deaths, on the excess death. I'm a little bit skeptical that there's maybe there's really the data are good. Um, but um, I don't think that now the immigration from um, from Ukraine um, will have today's um, situation in Poland. So when we think about the next two months or three months, we have done simulations here. What would in Poland the effect of a so-called Freedom Day? Freedom Day means we completely give up on all the restrictions. We don't test anymore, we don't contact trace, nobody wears masks, we return to life like before the epidemics. Because Poland had now also in the Omicron case um, such a large number of infections, uh, together with the still um, existing immunity, partial immunity in the population, we would probably not have a wave within the next two or three months, right? Maybe a little bit, a little bubble, but um, not really a big epidemic here. Um, it's too many people have built up at the moment immunity here. Now, of course, if you have massive import and um, it's very difficult to estimate um, how, what is the infection process now on this transport chain of immigrants is. That depends, I mean, if the people just come in by private, by private car and use a train and then get distributed, then um, there will be not um, such a huge um, infection process going on. If you have a lot of people concentrations like in a, in a refugee camp, as we know it from some other countries, you might have um, very densely packed, you might have, uh, this can create super hubs or somehow super spreading events easily, right? So one has to be a little bit careful, but I don't see the threat, um, uh, I wouldn't put it very high. Um, the other question is on endemic, and endemic means actually would COVID become a common disease where we face every year a wave, um, a seasonal wave, uh, maybe in spring, one in autumn, and um, would have to, to, to live with some, some restrictions depending what variant actually is, on, is, 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 is at the scenery. Now, this is entirely possible. Um, the, um, this is entirely possible. And um, so take the example of measles. Measles has um, extremely high infectivity. So the reproduction number is, is one of the highest of all known um, infectious diseases. Now, Omicron was conjectured to have similar values, probably not as high as measles. But what happens with measles? Because measles you get only once in your lifetime. Uh, you have in lifelong immunity, all right? So um, who gets infected? Not the adult persons, the elderly person, but the people who come in school. So the feeding really of the measles epidemics is by the kids in the first one or two years in school. And this is enough with the high infectivity to keep things going on, right? So. Um, Immunization or vaccination against measles became mandatory in Germany some time ago. They want to get rid of it. Um, 
this is one possibility that, um, and especially for highly infectious things, this can work out. So like the Omicron wave could be that we have, um, and here we have probably still raining, could um, uh, well always find every year enough freshly susceptible people by raining on part of the population and by the children which um, grow up and uh, go into kindergarten or schools and um, yeah, and then get it. Um, so that's one possibility. Um, there is also a, a possibility that um, less infectious things like, um, like Delta, for instance, will, um, will return. And um, due to waning of the, of the immunization by vaccination, um, now we get overcritical epidemics again. And it might be that uh, we get an equilibrium um, with these waves because now after some multiple infections, um, you have um, you get rid of the severe cases, right? So everybody has some part of immunity, and then it becomes a little bit like um, the flu or the common cold. Now I don't hope actually for that because. Um, it seems that in the one of the problems, and this is a, a remarkable difference to the influenza with COVID is, is this long COVID um, cases and this, this diseases which go systemic, even if it's are not hospital cases. You have at least some indication that um, dementia and, um, uh, right, so the, the, the brain is affected, which doesn't happen in influenza or the common cold, um, and long-lasting. And you have um, affections of other organs. So COVID is much more, even on a non-critical uh, progression of the disease, systemic um, than um, influenza is. And that is, so in that sense, COVID is not an infection you would really, well, live with. Um, might become different with Omicron. We don't know anything in Omicron and long COVID yet. And it might be that Omicron really extincts the our uh, variants. That could happen, right? Um, we have the alpha variant or the previous variant almost essentially got extinct and the delta variant dominated um, them and um, many of those um, get erased. Um, so I hope that we maybe get in the same way and have um, maybe a endemic Omicron, that would be the best, but um, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't bet on that. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? to our guest and speaker. Okay, so maybe again, a question from my side. Uh, you take into account the vaccination, right? But how, in in your models and models you are planning, the immune immunity, let's say, given by by vaccination, is constant or is variable? How how no, actually? No, 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 no. I mean, um, it depends um, what you want to predict. If you do um, mm -hmm. just uh, predictions for the next four weeks, so um, mm -hmm. short time things, then um, you can try to estimate the, the present um, immunity level in the population and keep it as constant. But in general, we don't assume this. So mm -hmm. if you want to have longer forecast scenarios are sometimes called as also now the open uh, European forecast scenario forecast up. So this is long time speculati speculations on how the epidemics will go. And models which do this, and we are no exception here, usually take um, waning functions into account. That means um, if certain functions which describe how the immunity or the, 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 
protection against infection or the protection against severe progression or the protection against um, death, um, given that the vaccination or a previous infection or a combination of both mm -hmm. happened at previous times, how this will wane and diminish over time. Now, the problem here is that these waning functions are not super well known. They are known, I mean, what the people usually do is you look into three groups, non-vaccinated, twice vaccinated, and boosted, so three times vaccinated. And then you still might distinguish between the different vaccinations they have, right? So definitely um, some vaccinations are better than some other ones. But um, within these groups are subgroups, and this you don't know um, how large the subgroups is. In among the vaccinated, uh, twice vaccinated, you have people who have previously had an infection. And they have a different immunity than the twice vaccinations which didn't have a previous infection. The same is with the not vaccinated. Non-vaccinated have split. Um, uh, are, this group is split into two subgroups, one who have been previously infected, one which didn't have been previously infected. And you usually don't know when this happened, these infections. I mean, some infections you know, but most of the infections went unnoticed, right? Poland has high dark figures in number of true cases. Um, something between five and ten um, and so most of the previous infections have not been registered as infections so if you do the statistics now into um, those non-infected and non-vaccinated non vaccinated you don't know how really the submixture is and that makes it very difficult to really estimate uh, precisely the waning function and to uh, compare it with other countries. Each country is here a little bit different. So just taking what's measured in Great Britain might be not the same what you would have to do in Poland here. And um, so this is still a very open um, and very important field of research, um, how this um, escape of immunity goes on and it's different for every different variant so um you see this is makes the models also quite complicated here you mm -hmm. might have you have also a subgroup which has um which is um somehow um, resistant to uh, vaccination so the vaccination doesn't build up any immune response um, people estimate between 5 and 10 percent. Um, they, they behave like naive people, naive in the sense they can get as sick and as they are as vulnerable as our one. It depends on a lot of cofactors, and as long as more, you have more cofactors, say genetic predispositions, you could also see how this impacts. So, um, this is, this is a difficult subject and um, a lot of questions open here still. We are working on this also. We have a little bit of project waning functions estimations here. Um, and um, yeah, we have it also in the model in, um, mm -hmm. but we are not sure the data problem is here. It's not the technical problem to build it in the model, but the data um, really the accuracy is, is, is yeah, mediocre, I would say. Yeah, and I still want maybe one point because it was made by David Spiegelman, um, a very, very famous statistician in, in Great Britain. So uh, when you would like to f estimate efficiency of, um, say, population vaccination against infection or severe progression, so you have relatively good count of how many people got vaccinated, right? So take it, the case of Great Britain in the age group of 40 to 50. Uh -huh. And 90% uh, of those people have, uh, 90, a large number got vaccinated. Now there is only maybe 10% um, or well, the, a minority which didn't get vaccinated. But you would have to know now how large this group is. And that is not known because Great Britain doesn't count, or haven't counted for a long time their population sizes. And now if you have 90% vaccinated and the other group is maybe um, I don't know how whole the, large the population is. It might be a million less or a million um, more. And this gives huge factors um, in the final estimation. 
We also don't have a precise count of the population. Now, the new census have been done last year. Um, we still don't have the, the, the information. Even if it was digital, they're still processing. And I mean, they always <laughs> think we are, the, 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 it's a little bit funny that state organizations which collect data treat the scientists as they would be Russian spies. And I really have to say this. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> right? <laughs> we don't have any commercial interest and they just want to do it for the good. And even if it's if it's for the ministry itself, won't we'll do it. It's there is a competition between the different um, data holder organizations um, and they there is not a love affair between the different organizations going on. Yeah, indeed, a lot of challenges here. Uh, complexity being added by uh, taking account those effects. Interesting. Thanks, thanks for your response. So, having said that, I I believe that our two hours passed really quickly. Yeah, I would like uh, once again thank you, uh, our dear speaker, for talking today. Thanks. Great topic, great research. I hope we could host you again someday in the future here on MLP.